You're sitting across from your dream employer, palms sweating when they ask, explain this difference between type one and type two errors and how you minimize them in a real world scenario. Your mind goes blank. Sound familiar? That single statistics question could make or break your interview, whether you're gunning for a data science role at Google or a quant role at Wall Street. The harsh reality? Most candidates walk into this interview completely unprepared for the statistical curveballs that might come your way. But here's what the successful candidates know that you don't. Statistics interview questions follow predictable patterns. And once you understand those patterns, you can nail any question that they throw at you. In this video, I'm gonna break down exactly what you need to ace the next statistics interview, how it differs depending on the role that you're interviewing for, and a complete roadmap of how to ace the easy, medium, and hard stats questions that you'll see on the interview. Before we dive into specific questions, let's understand the stats landscape. Stats interview questions generally fall into four different categories that interviewers use to assess your knowledge. First up and the most common are the foundational concepts. These test whether you understand the building blocks of statistics and not just memorizing formulas. Think probability distributions, hypothesis testing, and descriptive stats. You might get a question like, what's the difference between a z-test and a t-test? Or they'll ask you to explain the difference between type 1 versus type 2 errors. Next, we have problem-solving statistics questions. These are all about knowing how to apply stats to common business case study type problems. Here's an example. Let's say that you're given a question where a company's overall credit approval rates have dropped, but each product's individual approval rate has stayed the same. That's a classic setup for a Simpsons paradox. And then interviewer wants to know if you can spot it. In general, these kinds of questions are the ones that separate the people that just generally know some concept of stats versus the ones that can actually apply it in the real world. Then we have interpretation and communication questions. These generally test if you can explain stats to someone who doesn't have a technical or a statistical background, which is huge if you're a data scientist or an analyst and you have to present your findings to executives or business people. You might be asked a classic question, which is how would you explain a p-value to a non-technical person? Can you do it avoiding jargon? Can you also explain it by using a really common example like a weather forecast or a coin flip? Another example would be unbiased estimators. Could you explain what an unbiased estimator is to someone who's never taken a stats class? Here, the most important part is about your ability to simplify complex ideas versus going really deep into the technical details. And finally, the most common pattern I've seen is the A-B testing and experimentation section of stats questions. These questions really drive down into the overall concept of how you can actually design practical tests for business use cases, a lot of which are gonna be tech companies that are running A-B tests all the time. For example, one really common basic question is how would you design a button test where you're changing the color or maybe the positioning or size of the button. Next, let's talk about how stats questions vary by role. Most people don't realize that stats questions are going to be pretty different depending on what role you're interviewing for. Data scientists build predictive models and recommendation systems that directly impact product decisions, which is why their interviews focus heavily on experimentation and machine learning applications. You'll get questions like, how would you design an A-B test to measure the impact of a new recommendation algorithm? or explain bias, variance, trade-offs, and how it affects model performance. And in these roles, they really wanna see if you can apply stats to build and evaluate models that drive business decisions through this kind of controlled experimentation. Data analysts, on the other hand, extract insights from historical data to inform business strategy. So their interviews emphasize hypothesis testing and descriptive analytics rather than the forward-looking experimentation that data scientists focus on. Expect questions like, how would you test whether a new marketing campaign significantly increased sales compared to the previous quarter, or explain different types of sampling methods and when you'd use each one. The focus is really on your ability to rigorously test business hypotheses and extract actual insights from historical data. Lastly, quants also get a lot of stats questions in their interviews. If you're a quantitative developer or an analyst, you're developing mathematical models for financial markets where mathematical precision can mean millions in profits or loss, making their interviews the most mathematically rigorous of all data roles. You'll face questions like derive the Black-Scholes formula from first principles and explain the assumptions, or calculate value at risk for a portfolio using Monte Carlo simulation. All right, so enough background, let's actually jump into some really common SATS interview questions and how we would solve them. And I'm gonna start with basic, intermediate, and then advanced. Basic SATS questions generally show for any kind of role, but it'll depend basically if you're a junior or more senior candidate. For junior candidates, these questions often determine whether you move forward in the process, while for senior roles, 
They serve as a warm-up question before diving into more complex scenarios. The key difference is always the depth of the answer. Entry-level candidates need to show they understand the fundamentals, while experienced candidates are expected to discuss real-world applications, limitations, and when you choose one approach over another. At the end of the day, your goal is to actually truly demonstrate that you can grasp these concepts because you'll be applying them in your day-to-day -day anyway. Take, for example, these questions. When would you use mean versus median? When you're approaching this, don't just define the terms, explain why you choose one over the other in a real analysis scenario. An example sample answer would be, the mean gives the arithmetic average, while the median tells you the midpoint when the data is sorted. If you're analyzing income data and there are a few extremely high salaries, the mean gets pulled up and might not represent the typical employee, and that's where the median shines, as it's more robust to outliers. Here's another question, what's the difference between type one and type two errors? And again, we went through this before, but the key difference here is that we gotta use a clear example and we gotta highlight the real world implications of these different types of errors and how they're impacted, especially when one is more serious than the other. So here's an example answer. I would say a type one error is rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually true, a false positive. A type two error is not rejecting the null when it's actually false, which isn't a false negative. For example, in a medical test, a type one error means diagnosing someone with a disease they don't have, while a type two error means missing the disease in someone who does. In high stakes cases like disease detection, we might accept more false positives to avoid dangerous false negatives. The last basic question is how would you explain a p-value to a non-technical person? For example, what I would say is, a p-value helps us understand how surprising our data is if there's actually no real effect. Think about it like this. If you flip a coin and you get heads nine times in a row, you'd wonder if the coin is fair. The p-value tells you how likely that streak would be if the coin were fair. A low p-value means the result is unusual under the assumption that nothing's going on. So we start questioning that assumption. It's not the chance that our hypothesis is true or false, just how strange our data is if the null were true. Median level questions will generally appear later in the interview process and are pretty common with data science and data analytics roles, though quants might seal them as a warm up or they might also appear kind of in like the initial rounds for them. You also have to think through trade offs, clarify assumptions, and all that jazz. For example, how would you decide whether to launch a feature if it helps some users but hurts others? This tests your product's sense and ability to interpret A-B test results in the real world, especially when the impact isn't uniform across user groups. So a sample answer would be, first I'd segment the results to understand how the feature affects different cohorts, in this case, new users versus longtime users. Since engagement increased for users on the platform over a year ago, but decreased for new users, I dig into why that's happening. Are new users confused? Do the feature assume familiarity? Next, I'd weigh the overall impact. Do long-term time users make up the majority? Is their increased engagement more valuable to business goals? I'd also consider alternatives like a targeted rollout where only certain users get the change. The key is balancing global metrics with cohort level insights, sometimes launching for a subset that is better than a full release. How would you handle missing time series data in a climate data set? This is about choosing the right imputation strategy based on the structure of the data. In time series problems, especially with sensor or measurement errors, context matters more than general rules. Since it's time series data and we know that the first and last entries are valid, I'd use linear interpolation per city to fill the gaps. This assumes temperature changes gradually over time, which is reasonable for climate data. In pandas, I'd sort by city and date, then apply interpolate, which within each city group. It's more accurate than mean imputation because it respects the time ordering. And since we're told missing data never occurs on consecutive days, linear interpolation will always have valid points on either side. Lastly, how do you know if a month to month change in a time series is significant? I start by quantifying the change between this month and the previous month, maybe using a difference in means or proportions depending on the metric. Then I test whether that change is statistically significant using a paired t-test or time series specific method like ARIMA residuals. So these stats aren't really enough. I'd also check to see if the change is practically meaningful. For example, does a 2% shift actually matter for a business strategy? I'd look for seasonality or trends that might explain the change and avoid jumping to conclusions from short-term noise. Again, time series, context is everything. A spike in December means something very different than one in July. Finally, the advanced statistics questions, right? The level of mastery and understanding here is gonna be really hard. One example here is, how would you measure the impact of a product feature without an A-B test? This at the end of the day is applying how you can use concepts like causal inference, which we have a course on, on the interview query, by the way, in real world situations where you can't actually run experimentation. For example, let's say that since Spotify launched curated playlists without an A-B test, 
The biggest challenge is selection bias. Users who engage with a playlist might already differ from those who don't. And I start with a propensity matching score to compare users who did and didn't engage, but look at a similar prior behavior. Also, if there's a natural cutoff, say users who joined before versus after a launch date, I could apply a regression discontinuity approach. Alternatively, I could use a difference in differences setup, compare changes in engagement over time between playlist users and a control group. If you wanna check out more of this, you can go on interview query and read our course on causal inference. Another example of a question would be, how would you simulate a truncated normal distribution? So to simulate a truncated normal distribution, we're gonna be generating values from a normal distribution, but only keeping those that fall below a certain percentile, say the 75th percentile. We start with a normal distribution with a mean and standard deviation. Third question here, how would you prove that the median is greater than or equal to the mean for a strictly decreasing distribution? How we'd answer this is that when a probability density function is strictly decreasing, that means values are more concentrated on the left, higher probability for smaller values. And as a result, the distribution is skewed to the right. The mean, which is sensitive to extreme values, gets pulled left by the long tail of low probability, high value observations. The median, on the other hand, is the point where 50% of the distribution lies on either side. So it stays more central, which is why in a strictly de decreasing distribution, the median ends up greater than or equal to the mean. Question four, what's the probability that the median of three uniform variables is greater than a threshold? We're given three random variables from a uniform distribution between zero and four, and we want the probability that the median is greater than three. Since the variables are continuous and identically distributed, every ordering of the three values is equally likely. For the median to be greater than three, at least two values must be greater than three because the median is the middle value after sorting. So we just need the probability that at least two of the three numbers are above three. And again, I'll have that as an exercise for you as a reader. And if you want to check out any of these, of course, they're on interview query. So before we wrap up, let me just answer some frequently asked questions about stats interview questions. Number one, should I memorize all these formulas? Oh, so you shouldn't be memorizing formulas. You should be generally having an idea of what these formulas are. But like most companies will let you look at formulas during the interview. What if I'm asked a question I don't know? A lot of the time, it's about talking through your thought process. Interviews want to know how you think. Right. If you really don't know, you can ask for a hint and then kind of get through there. How much math do I need to show my answers? For data science, data analyst roles, not that much. For quant roles, I think it's going to be a lot more. Are these questions the same across all companies? The concepts are similar, but the implementation varies. Google might ask about A-B testing for YouTube recommendations, while a bank might ask about risk modeling. And remember, the key to acing these questions isn't just about memorizing things. It's about applying the concepts to these actual problems, case scenarios. So here's the thing, just knowing the questions is just the first step, but actually going through and practicing and getting good at acing the interview questions is gonna be something completely different. That's why I, at the end of the day, started Interview Query. It is a platform for anyone who's practicing stats, data science, data analytics, quant, any kind of math role field, anyone who needs to practice interview questions around this can actually learn iteratively using our you know, hints, gotchas, and kind of AI-assisted powered learning now, by the way, to actually get good at this material. After going through countless of interviews myself and then having my friends prep for these data roles, we have designed a platform that allows for any company for you to be able to filter by any company position and topic that you're looking for to actually find the question set that it will best prepare for your next interview. So please check it out. Basically, we've helped thousands of candidates land roles at top tech companies and financial firms. Don't let stats questions be the reasons that you miss out on your dream job. Check it out. I'll put a link in the description below. And if this video helped you actually out with your interview and you kind of like these guides as well as the other content that I'm putting out, please leave a comment or a like or anything. Hit subscribe if you're feeling it, you know, just whatever you want to do at the end of the day. All right. But thank you for watching. All right, bye.